Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ted Gardner, and I'm an interviewer for the Library of Congress Oral History Project, which is so capably run here at our public library of Cincinnati and Hamilton County. Uh, we're in the John T. Nolan room of our history department at our public library. And today we have the honor and the pleasure of interviewing Brad Phillips. And uh, it's a particular pleasure for me because Brad and I have been friends for a long time. But uh, we want to get to uh, talking about Brad. And Brad, you realize you're going to get a DVD from this for your, you and your family? I do, and that sounds attractive. <laughs> you can't beat it. <laughs> so um, I like to start out with, where were you born? I was born in uh, Evanston, Illinois, the Evanston Hospital in uh, March of 1923. My home at that time was really uh, in the northernmost uh, area in Chicago called Rogers Park. Mm -hmm. We had an apartment building that was on the lake there, East Lake Terrace. And then you go from East Lake Terrace through a small cemetery and you're in Evanston, which is the next door community. Right, beautiful and area. It's a nice area and they, they had a good hospital there. And right where my mother took me to introduce <laughs> me to the world. <laughs> uh, tell us about your family. Well, I have, I've been married uh, more than once, but I married a gal who also lived in Evanston, uh, and I hadn't met her until 1941, late 1941, when I went down to uh, Greencastle, Indiana, mm -hmm. and went to DePaul University. Uh, did you have brothers and sisters? I had one sister who was seven years older than I, mm -hmm. and she was the reason I went to DePaul, because I went one time to visit her, and I thought it was a nice campus, and I'd heard good things about the school. Sure. So I uh, matriculated there. Well, that is. That, it has a very, very uh, uh, high standing, and I know it's a very fine, fine college. Um, uh, Elementary school, high school? Well, the elementary school that I went to, um, uh, I lived on uh, East Lake Terrace in Chicago until I was uh, approximately uh, first or second grade. And then we moved to Wilmette, which is the next uh, community beyond er Evanston. And the Central School on Central Street was the uh, <laughs> place where I went to elementary school. Okay. And they, they had... Uh, uh, eight grades in that school, and from there I went up to high school. Okay. What uh, high school did you go to? It was called New Trier, and it was located yeah. in Winnetka. Yeah. That's I, think it was, I think it was a very good high school. Excellent. Yes. I, they, I, they certainly I brag heard. about themselves a lot. And, Absolutely. Uh, I'm sure some of it is deserved. Well, <laughs> absolutely. Um, uh, then from New Trier, uh, there in high school, give us a little bit of, of your background, what your interests were in high school, activities and that sort of thing. Okay, I was a, um, I guess a, just a regular guy. I, uh, I played some baseball and football and did some skating and some skiing and some tennis. Wonderful. But I was not the champion of any one of those things. I'm the same I was way. probably uh, on the chart compared to other students a little better in uh, tennis and skiing, but I was not better in baseball or football. <laughs> so anyway, I, uh, I grew up uh, there and um, enjoyed life. Nutria is in a nice area. Sure. And they, it was a pretty big school. I think they had a, the maximum enrollment when I was there was 2,700. Wow. Good sized school. So it was a sizable school. I should say. My wife, whom I had let, met later down in Greencastle, as I uh, think I mentioned, uh, went to Evanston High School. And we oh, yes. were uh, always uh, trying to beat Evanston and usually did mm -hmm. in whatever we did, whether it was swimming or, right. or football or whatever. And there you were in a nice college atmosphere too with yeah. Northwestern University. That's right. And it's also the international headquarters of Rotary International Evanston. I didn't know that, but I, uh, at the time, Yeah. I did learn that later. Yeah. Uh, did you get inspired by a teacher or some, something like that in high school to head you in a certain direction? For I did really, even though I think I had some very good professors, I liked 
engineering subjects and thought I had a little uh, ability in that mm -hmm. area. But when I went down, when I graduated in 1940 from high school uh, and decided to go to DePaul University, I was getting the impression that engineers weren't being paid as handsomely as guys in the marketing and selling area. Right. So I switched and decided to do that. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, as you know, the war, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor in 1941. And um, uh, that was uh, that was the year in which uh, I uh, wanted with my roommate to uh, help the United States fight the Japanese. Mm -hmm. And so I applied for uh, the Signal Corps had an officer's training program. And I, my roommate and I applied f for it and we were both accepted. And for some reason, and uh, I don't really know it because my roommate, Hugh Redding, was a pretty bright guy, but for some reason, uh, he flunked out of uh, Illinois Institute of Technology where the, where the uh, Signal Corps had sent us. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remained, and in fact, they wanted me to become a teacher there, so I did that. And I went to a small town about 60 miles from downtown Chicago called Naperville. Mm -hmm. And radar was the... Um, uh, was a new technology in those days, and it was very helpful to the Brits, who, uh, you know, faced uh, constant bombing from the Germans coming from uh, uh, Europe and Germany, and um, uh, it, it was a sufficiently new technology, there weren't any books on it. Right. <clears throat> we were working for mimeograph sheets mm -hmm. uh, coming out of England, and uh, the uh, school operated uh, with the aims of being able to instruct how the how radar is to be installed and maintained and operated. And the school operated on three shifts a day for seven days a week, wow. 52 weeks a year, because yeah. this is a hot time for England. <clears throat> so uh, I had been there approximately a year, well, and I was just a dumb college kid, of course. I didn't realize that I was probably doing something valuable for my country, but it did feel, I felt like I ought to be shooting somebody. Yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> so I, uh, I, Action. De <laughs> I departed from the uh, 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 Naperville uh, Training Center and I applied to the Air Force. We're running uh, programs for pilots down in Miami. And I then went down to Miami and graduated from their program only to discover they didn't want as many pilots as they had yeah. trained. So um, uh, they said, well, we'll put you in the infantry. And I said, Jay, what else can I do? Because I, really I don't want to do that. <laughs> and they said, well, uh, the only thing we can think of is uh, uh, we need some chemical engineers. So if you can pass some tests, well, we'll send you up to St. John's University in, in Brooklyn and uh, they'll teach you the chemistry that we want you to know. So that happened, and I went up to St. John's University in Brooklyn and had a semester there in which I did okay, but they didn't want as many engineers as they had trained. Mm -hmm. So they said, we really want you to get into the infantry. And I said, is there any, uh, anything else <laughs> I can do? And they finally said, well, we could, you could get into the airborne infantry. And I thought, well, at least I like flying, and. Uh, I'll be getting a ride to work, so <laughs> I'll, I'll do that. So I joined the uh, 101st Airborne Division, and they were training in Reading, England. And I... Uh, did you go across on a ship? Yes, I did. I went across, and I can't remember the name of the ship, but it was a pretty good-sized ship. It was 700 and some odd feet. Mm -hmm. And it was normally a, a, a nice quality ocean liner, not the top quality, but a good one nevertheless and it had a board at some 10,000 troops, of which I was one. Wow. And in their big uh, dance auditorium, they had 10 layers of deck, of, of beds racked up in that big room, so that you could, if you were in, in level seven, you climbed up to level seven, got into bed, and then put some straps around you, so as the boat healed one way or the other, uh, you didn't fall out and get badly hurt. <laughs> what an experience. Uh, but it was a uh, 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 successful crossing. It took us about seven or eight days to cross. 
and we landed in England and trained in, uh, trained in Reading. But um, I was disappointed to discover that on my first jump, not in combat, my first practice jump, I broke cartilages in one of my knees and I can't even remember which one. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so they, uh, they disqualified me from further airborne training and put me somewhere to rest my knee, namely the infantry. So um, Back was, to the infantry. Yeah. <laughs> so that's how I got started in the infantry. They finally won out. Yeah. They, oh, golly. They persuaded me by simply <laughs> yeah, telling me right. that's, that's what you're going to do. <laughs> well, now, uh, how long were you there in England? Uh, do you remember? Only, only a few months. Okay. I, I don't believe it was uh, as long as... Uh, uh, six or seven months, but I, I, I have the impression without being exactly mm -hmm. knowledgeable that it was uh, three or four months. Right. And then uh, we crossed the channel and uh, D-Day had already occurred, uh, June 6th, of course. And uh, when I crossed the channel, it was not under fire. The D-Day had already occurred and we were pushing inland. And I uh, was... Uh, put into a division called the 102nd Ozark Division. Oh, yeah. Now, where, where did you go ashore? Near I went ashore at uh, La Havre. At La Havre. Right. And uh, I, as I say, we were not under fire, so it was an easy, um, it was not nearly what they put up with on Omaha Beach. Right. And uh, so we went across the top of Germany. We first went through Paris and then went up uh, across the top of Germany and Belgium and uh, uh, the, in Holland. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, I can remember one thing in Holland. When we were, when we were in Holland, the, the Dutch were very appreciative of the American effort to uh, yes. help them get the Germans out of there. And they would invite soldiers to have dinner with them. And of course, they'd slay the fatted calf and they'd give mm -hmm. us wonderful dinners. Wonderful. And we had been accustomed to um, K rations and things that were not nearly as rich as this stuff, and it made me sick as a dog to eat that dinner. <laughs> but I recovered, of course. <laughs> um, uh, did you get to spend any time in Paris? Only a couple of days, couple but I did. Days. Uh, those two days were fun. Right. I'd never been there before, and I have uh, have fond memories of it. That beautiful city. I yes, should it say, is. I should say. Well. That's that's very interesting because they're moving you pretty rapidly up there in northern northern part of France and uh, well we fought across the t the top of uh, Germany really we uh, I don't know where these uh, towns are on a map because I never really studied that but uh, we went through a town called Gerensweiler and I remembered it pretty well because we had to fight to get into the town mm -hmm. and that was my first experience in uh, being shot at. Uh, and it was more than mildly unsettling. <laughs> no, I should say. Uh, and, uh, but I didn't get injured and we went through Gerensweiler. Then the next town I can remember was Linnich, L-I-N-N-I-C-H. And I remember being on a road in Linnich and having a German tank come uh, facing uh, my, um, the people with whom I were fighting, I was fighting, and uh, this road was one in which there were trees planted on both sides, and it wasn't a very wide road, so I'll, I'll guess that, uh, so, and anyway, this fellow, the tank uh, commander, fired a couple of 88 uh, millimeter shells down that long road, and it really uh, convinced me that sure I, I didn't want to be anywhere near it. No, I should say not. So you did, uh, you saw the enemy up fairly close, huh? Yes, I did, and they had also uh, not, uh, now I've got to get my approximate timing in mind here, uh, until Christmas of 1944, uh, we had not made giant stri strides, mm -hmm. but after, approximately then is when the overall weight of the uh, onslaught from the Allies was being felt by the Germans. And um, the um, uh, Germans, as, as everyone knows, uh, the, well, anyway, the, the division I was in was guarding the um, 
area around the Ardennes forest. Oh, yes. And then uh, Hitler, in a last major effort to uh, stave off defeat and possibly getting the Allies to talk about terms for a, a uh, surrender, uh, they uh, created the Battle, Battle of the Bulge, and the Bulge was a pressure against our lines uh, that was made to be felt by the Germans. And um, I was pretty impressed that the Army had managed to get warm food up to foxholes mm -hmm. in the winter in Germany, and uh, they actually did. So I remember that. Mm -hmm. And I remember being pinned down one time outside of my foxhole, and there, the, the ground was pretty flat, so there weren't a lot of places to hide. And I was out looking for blankets or anything in other foxholes that were no longer uh, being lived in, and I got caught. And uh, every time I'd lift my head up a little bit, why there would be a machine gun firing at me, and fortunately it couldn't depress itself <laughs> enough to hit me. But it certainly did impress me. Oh my, yeah. The the sound alone from something like that oh, was yeah. pretty, pretty frightening. Um, your, your injury, uh, your injury that you sustained, <laughs> which put you back into the infantry for some strange reason, uh, <clears throat> did that hobble you in any way? Was that a little, but not, not very much. I, I was really able to be a pretty good. Uh, Soldier, keep up with them. Yeah, and they, I was, uh, of course, at that age, you you don't think anything is going to stop you from doing whatever you want to do. That's right. Did you march a lot? Did you have a lot of? Not a great deal. I found that they typically they they took you in uh, trucks to approximately the battle site, and then you got out and walked the rest of the way. Right. But the in terms of percentage, I'd say it was ninety percent by a vehicle Transport, and ten percent right. by. Um, Shanks Bear. How how about your how about your advancement in rank? What what was going on? Well, I I, I guess um, my family will probably not write up a piece for the paper on this, but when I joined, I was a private, and with only two years of experience, I shot right up to private first class. All Got an way. enormous increase in wow, uh, wages. I think it was went from fifty to fifty four dollars a month. Yeah, yeah, that was something to write and home And they about. gave me a place to sleep, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> if I dug it out of the ground, I could sleep there. And uh, all the clothes I could wear, and, and a big, heavy uh, Browning automatic rifle. Right. <laughs> Good B.A.R. Well, yeah. that's, <clears throat> that, that was so typical, of course, but, you know, when you experience it yourself, it's something special. Well, it is, and... Um, uh, I know uh, as the campaign went through Germany, we came, I remember one time we came up upon the Roar, R-O-E-R -E is mm -hmm. the way they spell it, the Roar River, which uh, in its basic uh, directional flow is uh, north and south. And it wasn't uh, a difficult river to uh, cross because it wasn't terribly deep. It was maybe five feet, something like this, and maybe only less than 100 mm -hmm. feet wide. So, uh, but the, you know, the things like vehicles and tanks could not cross that, so we had to find bridges that were over the, the roar that we could use. And uh, we were constantly patrolling to find out where the German mm -hmm. forces were. And uh, also, the, somewhere in Northern Germany, they had what the Germans called the Siegfried Line. Yep. And this was to be a uh, German counterpart to the French uh, Maginot Line. And uh, uh, our division was under the control of uh, the Brit uh, uh, Montgomery. And Montgomery was a very, very reserved, cautious gentleman. And he wanted to know whether the Siegfried Line had very many people in it. Uh, in other words, instead of rushing a full division or two into sea, he sent, he sent some, just some scouts out. And I mm -hmm. was on one of those scouting trips, and I remember it, was, it had been snowing pretty uh, hard, so they gave us white sheets to make uh, uh, coveralls, in effect, out of, and wrapped our guns with um, 
uh, white sheets so that they wouldn't be so obvious on the snow. And we did not get fired upon, which uh, was what Monty wanted to find out. Because they thought, you know, we, we did approach the lion and clearly we were not, uh, we had not been invited by anybody in Germany. So he wanted to find out how much uh, uh, is going on behind the Siegfried Lion. So even though we'd camped there about a month, <clears throat> we didn't get any uh, response out of the Siegfried hmm. Lion. So we assumed correctly, it turned out later, that it was not fully manned or even manned hardly at all. Did you get into villages uh, that had been destroyed or anything Yes, like we that? did, and I have impressions. I remember getting, I don't remember exactly at what part of the uh, uh, service that I uh, did this, but I remember getting to Aachen and seeing that it's hard to tell where the streets were in Aachen because it was just about 10 to 15 feet uh, thick bricks that are broken out of Wrong. buildings and you couldn't tell which was a which was a, a street and, and or just right. they, they just weren't identifiable. Terrible. Uh, I did get a minor injury. Uh, I was hit by a um, mortar uh, round went off fairly near where I was and uh, I went to first aid station just I got a number of peppered in the in the face by this thing and uh, but no I think it was mostly ice and broken pieces of frozen dirt that hit me because mm -hmm. I they didn't have to take any metal out of my face and yeah. Did they award you the Purple Heart? They did, which surprised me because I couldn't, you know, I didn't really lose any time at all. I went into the aid station to have them swab these uh, uh, small abrasions out, and they well, did that. that. That's, very, that's very important, Brad, and, and, and I'm, I'm so happy to know that, uh, as you explained it, that you, you were deserving of that. And, and that's uh, it's interesting for your family to know and your friends because... Well, I remember one time, I don't know if you know Mike Dooley, but uh, Mike uh, asked me one time, he said, gee, the holders of the Purple Heart are having some kind of a meeting downtown. Why aren't you, this was the evening that mm -hmm. they were meeting, he says, why aren't you down there celebrating with them? I said, well, you know, I, I've seen some people come back from war with just god-awful life altering ways of uh, being maimed. You know, they lost a leg or their eyesight or something like that. And I would hate to go down there and have somebody ask me, well, how badly were you hurt? And I said, well, I was maybe 20 minutes at the aid station. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're very modest about that, but it is, uh, you, you certainly uh, earned it and, and greatly deserving of that, that honor. And that is a great honor. Uh, you know, there is a National Purple Heart Association and uh, they celebrate uh, every August. Uh, we have a big celebration down on Fountain Square every year for the Purple Heart. Um, did you, besides, uh, besides the Rohr River, did you cross any other rivers in Germany? Uh, none of any size. We came up upon the Rhine later mm -hmm. uh, and we were at that point one of the closest divisions to Berlin. But uh, the decision had been made uh, at Allied headquarters to uh, hold back and let the Russians take Berlin. So we waited some weeks there on the uh, west, of, west of the Rhine River, mm -hmm. waiting for the Russians to do that. And uh, during that time, I can remember uh, finding a, uh, somebody, some German family's wine cellar and liberating a lot of old wine. And I thought, well, some of this stuff is, you know, 60 years old, 100 wow. years old. It's going to be wonderful. So I took some of it back to where we were uh, uh, barracked, and uh, the uh, stuff tasted absolutely terrible. It was oh. just vinegar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gee. Yeah, probably not uh, not properly corked. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe it had been good one time, but yeah, right. Then. Drink it now. Well, uh, 
Did you have any personal contact with uh, French families or German families? Uh, not any that I got to know, really, except I, uh, I remember one time being impressed that some German, uh, some French farmer uh, came up to me when we were in northern uh, Germany there, uh, top of France, rather, and uh, he gave me three fresh eggs. And uh, I was very appreciative because oh. we didn't have any fresh food at all. Right. So uh, that was, uh, how, know, they, they were genuinely appreciative. How, how, did you, how did you prepare them? Well, I, I kept them for two or three days and, uh, and they had no refrigeration, of course. But this was before the weather uh, uh, turned to the point where you couldn't very well be outside without wrecking something. <laughs> and uh, we, had, uh, we had commandeered a house and there was cooking facility in the oh, house. Yeah. Yeah. So we cooked the eggs and made them in omelets. Sure, you bet. Yankee ingenuity. Yeah, something <laughs> like that. <laughs> well, that is something. Those are, all, those are all wonderful memories. I'm glad that you remember them and can pass them on. Um, so there you were, uh, west of Berlin, waiting for the bloody Russians to get caught up with you. And of course, Patton was so angry about that and so frustrated. Yeah. Uh, the, I did have one other surprise, and that is I had been on a couple of patrols for, in which I'd been asked to go on them, and I volunteered, and they gave me a bronze star for one of them. Wow, uh, good for you. And my uh, squad leader, his name, he, this is a, um, a uh, Polish guy out of Detroit, Tom Gajewski, lived up in the Hamtramck, uh, got uh, Bronze Star as well as I did for the patrol. And later I, I looked for Tom uh, after the war was over and I found him up there and uh, we got together uh, for a brief reunion one weekend about uh, th three or four years ago. Wonderful. And he had uh, two oak leaf clusters for his bronze star. Oh, or in other words, he'd been awarded three times. Sure. Uh, yeah. Been honored three times for bronze. Wow. Well, <clears throat> well, the bronze star is a very, very prestigious award. And uh, congratulations on that. Because that isn't handed out uh, um, higgledy-piggledy, you know. And uh, you have to really do something to earn that. And that's a great honor, and there again, people should know about that, about you. So uh, I, I can just visualize your, your ribbons, you know, your European campaign and your Purple Heart and your Bronze Star on top of And I had a Rifleman's uh, And your Rifleman. Uh, emblem. Rifleman badge, yeah, yeah, I should say. I, I had reasonable amounts of fruit salad is what they, yes, always, I should say what they always so. called it. <laughs> um, Speaking of that, uh, being a rifleman, the infantry, highly regarded, uh, did you enjoy uh, marksmanship and then, uh, thing like well, that? Well, I did way before the war. Yeah. I, I, when I was in high school, they had a um, uh, marksman's course in shooting, mm -hmm. and we used typically uh, 22 caliber uh, uh, weapons. And the idea was accuracy, and uh, of course, and uh, uh, I was a pretty good shot. Good. good. So uh, now that's quite different from taking a uh, Browning automatic rifle, because of course, as as several uh, bullets go off, everything changes the exact aiming of the weapon a lot. Right. right. So you have to kind of hope to catch something in a stream from lower left to upper right. <laughs> right. Hope that some of them in there get the guy you want to get. <laughs> and under pressure from the enemy too. Yes. Good heavens, that yeah. is a whole different ball game. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I congratulate you on that. That's wonderful. I, the, um, the, the situation, the, you know, the geopolitical aspect of where you were and what you were facing and the fact that you had to hold back, I mean, the Yanks could have gone into Berlin uh, so so much more earlier, you know. Yes, they could have, and I don't think there would have been nearly the stiffness of resistance. Right. Because the Germans were uh, understandably terrified of the uh, Russians because they felt that, uh, everyone in Russia felt that uh, 
Hitler had uh, made promises which he just lied about. Yes. And uh, they were, they wanted to get back. Oh yes. And they did, of course. Well, and and you know, we read about it in history books and so forth, and so many wonderful books have been written since the war about this thing that actually the German people, you know, they couldn't come out in the open and say we don't like Hitler and we don't, you know, but they really had, only 25 years before they'd, they'd been wiped out in, in the World War I. Yeah. Well, I, I, it must be a, a stain on their country that will uh, maybe never be never. Uh, uh, erased, no. because you know the terrible things they did in uh, uh, in the treatment of the Jews and other That's prisoners, right. um, so-called Holocaust and all that. One of uh, my friends was in a different part of the 102nd Division, <coughs> and they came across a uh, a German prison camp called Gardelagen. That was the name of the town. And they had roughly a thousand uh, prisoners there. And when the Germans realized that the Allies were getting so close that they were likely to come in and, and free the prisoners, why they, uh, the prison guards herded them all into one big building, boarded up the doors and set it afire so that they killed most of the thousand who were there and the few who were able to break through the machine gun as they got through the hole in the wall that they had breached. And so the Germans were not uh, about to uh, admit they're having done anything wrong. That's right. Well, so much of that, of course, came out in the, uh, the post-war Nuremberg trials, right. you know, and really showed those leaders what they were. Yeah. What terrible, terrible people they were. Yeah. And, uh, well, <clears throat> I, I've always been interested in people and, and you're interfacing with different nationalities over there. Uh, I didn't have that opportunity in the South Pacific, but um, has always fascinated me, uh, the philosophy of people and, and the inhabitants of war-torn countries. Yeah, yeah. Um, did you get into Berlin eventually? I did not then. Uh, later, I was in Berlin, but not during the war. Oh, I see. Uh, and uh, I know the Japanese had characterized the war between uh, the United States and Germany as a gentleman's war. You know, the, yeah. uh, the Japanese did terrible things to their prisoners, and they were just unspeakably cruel because they felt you shouldn't have ever uh, enabled uh, your opponent to put you in prison. Sure. So if you were that kind of a coward, why well, they wanted to beat you up a little bit, oh, or yeah. a lot, and of course, our present uh, candidate for the presidency, uh, John McCain, was captured and beaten and tortured for several years over there in uh, yeah. Vietnam, uh, which illustrates kind of the attitude that the uh, that the uh, Japanese had. Well, yeah, it really does, and of course, uh, the aspect, jumping ahead a little bit, uh, at that time, uh, we anticipated having to go across the Pacific, you know, after we... Yes, and I was thinking of that, too. I'll bet you were. And not looking forward to it. Uh, but I read uh, the, the uh, uh, publication that the troops got was called Stars and Stripes, yes. and it was in newspaper. Wonderful paper. And they had some humor in it and some news. Right. And one time after uh, some in the in the year 1945, early, maybe uh, early summer, they had a uh, news item to the uh, effect that uh, the United States had, had perfected a new weapon that had dramatic explosive uh, capability and they dropped such a weapon on a city called Hiroshima in Japan and it re leveled almost everything in the city and killed many tens of thousands. And um, 
And then later, just a few days later, they dropped another bomb, a bomb on Nagasaki, with similar results. Yes. And I know, I know there have been people saying that we should not, Harry Truman should not have approved uh, that uh, action. But I don't agree. I, I think it was actually a lifesaver because oh, yes. the Japanese, in the way they fought, wouldn't give up. They simply had to be killed. That's right. And in getting that close to them, why we were certainly going to lose a lot, a lot of uh, American lives as well. So taking the American, the, the Japanese mainland uh, by, you know, building by building, room by room, mm. city by city, would have been an incredibly costly uh, battle. Yes, and it would have, and it would have killed millions more of the civilians. Oh, absolutely. So it, it, you know, their their argument against that, and of course, yeah, the, in the two cities where the bombs were dropped, I guess maybe, maybe a little less than two hundred thousand people were killed. Well, of course, that's terrible. You know, it, it's horrible. But it really did prevent the, the killing of millions of people on both sides. Something was required to demonstrate to the. Japanese leadership that um, uh, it, it, it's just uh, common sense to say, okay, let's stop this war now, That's we'll right. give up. That's right. So, uh, and we behaved, I thought, very uh, uh, properly in the way we treated the Japanese and in the way that we overtook the uh, mm. uh, winning of the war and the, uh, uh, we didn't, uh, they ended up having a lot of respect for us. It seems like every every war we fight, we have to help our enemy at the yeah. end of it, you know, after we defeat them. Uh, getting back to your situation there in uh, Western Germany, uh, Northern Germany, uh, <clears throat> so there you were, you didn't get into Berlin, then, then what was the the action for you then? Uh, with well, when the war ended, which was, I believe, in May of 1945, right. uh, we, uh, we, were, we were sent down to uh, an area, and I, I, I can remember one of the towns there, it was in the, the Hartz Mountains, and it was called Hof, H-O-F. <laughs> and we were just to wait there for transportation back to the USA. And the transportation wait was uh, longer than anyone had anticipated because the first ships that they uh, tried to repatriate troops on were Liberty ships, which had been built in California by uh, uh, Kaiser. By Kaiser, and some of the ships were breaking up in the North Atlantic and the North Sea in the winter. And of course, it was—it's terrible to think that you. Your, your, sol your soldiers went through the war and were alive and then you got them killed on the way home because uh, of uh, bad uh, boat facilities. So we had to wait until we got some bigger boats. And so um, we went down to Hof uh, where, uh, I don't know who was the spark plug to start it, but we started to organize into, uh, uh, we organized an orchestra and I, pl I played an instrument and uh, so I was in the orchestra and I enjoyed it. What'd you play? I played the trumpet. Wow. <laughs> and uh, the main thing about the trumpet is it can make a lot of noise. Oh yeah. So that uh, unlike a piano, which you could tinkle on quietly at night and probably not bother anybody, if you're playing a trumpet, <laughs> you're probably gonna keep everybody else awake. Well, it always reminds us of that old, that old popular hit tune of those war years of Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy of Company B. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I can see you as a trumpeter, by golly. Uh, uh, that uh, nah, I, it was I, a great I, instrument. One other thing about the trumpet, you could, you could do all the things a bugle can do. Mm -hmm. So you could play reveille and taps sure. and, and Play all those others. calls, yeah. Yes, you can do that, and, uh, and I occasionally did that. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Good. Uh, it was a uh, well. That was fun too. I did that in the Navy too, and and, and it was fun because it kind of set you aside a little bit. Yeah. You know, something a little extra that you had to offer. Right. And that was great. <laughs> uh, 
So uh, there you were in uh, Hoof, and uh, they finally, you finally got orders to go to a proper ship, huh? Yeah, we went up to Bremerhaven and picked oh. up uh, uh, the larger ships that they were then uh, sending out, and I, I forgot the date on which I got repatriated, but it was somewhere in the uh, late summer or early fall, and we came, and we had an un uh, eventful, very satisfying uh, trip across the ocean, the Atlantic, and landed in uh, New York. I've read about Bremerhaven and during the war, and of course it was heavily bombed by yeah. the Allies because it was a, a major harbor. Uh, did you, while you were there, did you notice destruction? And yes, and uh, it's, it's quite a modern city now. Yeah. The last time I was there was probably in the 1990s. Oh, really? When I was operating the company that I owned, and uh, we went to Braverhaven because a, uh, uh, a, a customer we had was headquartered in Braverhaven, and uh, we went to see it. And it's quite a handsome city now. You know, they've got the, still got the water, and the, uh, uh, and some of the old buildings have been reconstructed, mm -hmm. and uh, they're very handsome. Mm -hmm. But you can see the effect of a lot of damage. Oh yes. Bomb I'm told damage. that there's still a lot of cities in northern Europe that show yeah. devastation, and they just haven't. London, of course, has done a remarkable job. Yes, of they have. Restoration and new buildings and so forth. Yeah. Well, okay. So then you came back on a big liner, did you? Uh, it wasn't that big a liner, not nearly as big as the boat we went over on, uh, but it was a, a boat that would not sink. <laughs> and uh, where it would, it would take the uh, rough weather in the North Sea and, sure. uh, and to manage it. But I came back then and from there we went by train to uh, the Great Lakes Naval Training Station where they uh, ushered us out of the Army. And then uh, my wife whom I had married in the, uh, I guess it was in the early 1940s, uh, was waiting for me there and we lived temporarily with her family and then her older sister had a house in Evanston and rented us a room so we were able to get uh, oh boy situated by ourselves yeah, what a what home. a reunion getting back together yeah again. that was great oh homecoming was really it was, was really something I should yeah. say so and uh, uh, now your your old your sister who you said was seven years older than you, yeah, and she was there too, was she? Uh, she was living in Rockport, uh, Illinois. Oh yeah. Her husband was an employee of Mobile Oil Company. He was kind of in the middle management there, and um, Marty and Betty lived down in in I said Rockport. I think it's Rockford. Rockford. Rockford, Illinois. Yeah. Illinois. And. Uh, uh, now, I certainly saw them, but uh, they didn't come up to greet mm -hmm. me on my arrival from the Great Lakes Naval Training Station. Right. Well, that, you know, those, those, were, those were exciting days. And, you know, we all, or at least the pervading philosophy at that time for the returning GIs was, you know, get home, get a family, yeah. get your own house, Get in a good job, build a business or whatever. What what did you look forward to then? Well, I I didn't have any um, specific field that I wanted to do something in. I just wanted to get a job, right? So I could afford to be married. <laughs> and uh, I found a small company that manufactured industrial textiles and uh, industrial rubber products. And it was the name of it was Western Felt Works. <laughs> So I went to work for Westernfeld, and I was a technical salesman for a while. Uh, and then they gave me a territory around Chicago in which I would call on customers as a salesman. And I did all right, so they uh, expanded my responsibility a little bit, sent me up to uh, Milwaukee where uh, I started an office for that company and used uh, uh, and had the territory of uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota, hmm. and that uh, was a sales experience, and I, I liked selling, and uh, I was doing well, 
So I stayed there for a while, and then the company moved me from there to um, uh, New York City. No, I'm sorry, from there to Boston. And uh, we had a lot of business in Boston, and I started an office there and left it behind when the company moved me down to New York City. And then I uh, lived in uh, New Jersey in kind of a nice commuter town there called Short Hills. Mm. And um, I, in, in Short Hills, I decided I wanted to get off on, on um, my own because I was a little disappointed that my employer uh, wasn't taking advantage of some things that uh, that company had done. For example, when plastic pipe was quite new, mm -hmm. we were one of the suppliers, but we didn't buy the very expensive injection molding machinery or extrusion machinery that we should have bought to be a major factor. So we just did the little bit that we could do with old fashioned equipment. And I had the mental image of climbing the corporate ladder, but the ladder instead of going up, going down. <laughs> oh, so uh, uh, so I, uh, in the last move that Western Felt had asked me to make was to Fort Wayne, Indiana which was one of the towns uh, that was making a lot of fractional horsepower motors mm -hmm. in which they used felt and rubber. So I did that uh, and I, I found that a satisfying move from a business standpoint, but uh, uh, my bride uh, who loves fashion and likes to look good and the latest uh, uh, designer's goods uh, discovered that the major fashion center in Fort Wayne, Indiana was Sears Roebuck and Company, mm -hmm. and uh, so she couldn't stand being there. <laughs> so I met an across the street neighbor, and the two of us looked for businesses to get into Good. together for a period of a little over a year. That was an interesting inspiration. Yeah, it was. <laughs> and I'd come down to Cincinnati uh, because of a uh, business broker that uh, had run an ad in the Wall Street Journal about a uh, Art Bronze company for sale. This Art Bronze company made uh, very fancy uh, balusters and, and uh, bank vault doors and, mm. and uh, uh, they were a small company located in Cincinnati. And uh, my partner at the time was the guy with the money so I was junior to him and uh, he would have me visit any potential acquisitions and then give him a report. And uh, I gave him a favorable report on, not on the Art Bronze Company, uh, but uh, that, that broker called me after I got back from my uh, disappointing visit to the Art Bronze Company and said, there's another company for sale here, Solo Marks Rubber Company. <laughs> and I said, well, what do they make? He says, well, they make uh, rubber footwear and uh, various other things. So I went down to see that, and my uh, partner at the time, Dudley, uh, didn't like, particularly like to drive. And he, while he had an aircraft, he had a plane, he never would use it except in perfect weather. And so it didn't per turn out to be perfect when I had a date to look, go look. So he did not come with me and I drove down to Cincinnati and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the company, Solo Marks Rubber Company, was liked by most of the retail stores to whom they sold their goods. Uh, but I thought the quality of the goods was not very good. And I thought, well, maybe I could fix that. So we, uh, I decided I wanted to do it, and Dudley did not want to um, be a part of it at the time, but I thought this company was not making very much money, and I thought maybe I could actually afford to buy it on my own. So I put my house up for sale, and I had three cars, put a couple of them up for sale, and I cashed in everything I could manage to cash in, and I bought Solomark Rubber Company. Wow. And uh, What a leap. <laughs> that was a leap, and I, uh, I know uh, uh, the year in which I bought them, they'd done about $700,000 in 
net sales for the year, and after they'd paid their chief executive 25000 which to me was a fatter paycheck than I was getting, they had $5,000 left over. So they had, <laughs> they, had a, they had a relatively small profit, which was, and they didn't own the factory, they, were just, they just leased it. Or they, they didn't own the buildings, they owned the machinery in them. So I was able to buy it and uh, uh, operate it, and I was, was uh, effective in getting sales up Television was new in those days, and department stores are past masters at how to run newspaper advertising effectively for their uh, use. But they didn't know anything about uh, television. So I, Alfred Steele was then chairman of Pepsi-Cola, and he'd written a small how do you do it book for Pepsi-Cola Cola bottlers across the country. Hmm. Now big ones in Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, so forth, didn't need this because they had major ad agencies helping them do this kind of stuff. What if you're in, uh, I don't know, uh, a little town in Kentucky, uh, having to be bottling Pepsi-Cola, they don't have any big ad agencies down there. So he, didn't, so he was writing this book for those small mm -hmm. bottlers to do better marketing. And I thought the book was good, so I read it and I, uh, I uh, decided to operate that way and it worked. And I got uh, good profits. And one year, the, the guy with whom I was looking at businesses, Dudley, Dudley Ruttenberg was his full name, was called by a friend of his. And um, uh, the friend asked him, I said, Dudley, you've been operating that printing company there in Fort Wayne. He was printing paint chips, so if you went into a paint store, mm -hmm. you you could get color number 306 by taking a gallon of pure white and putting in, uh, say, a half pint of rose number 304. <laughs> <laughs> so somebody had to print those colors. That was very accurately. precise, wasn't it? Yes. So uh, his friend uh, had called Dudley and said, uh, Dudley, listen to this deal I've been offered. And, Dudley did and said, well, it sounds good to me. It was a company making uh, sales books, like, you know, you go into a hamburger shop and they write on a little pad, mm -hmm. one hamburger, no fries, one Coke. The, the, the maker of that little pad was uh, what was for sale, called the Nebraska Sales Book Company. <laughs> so um, uh, Dudley gave his friend, the, uh, uh, his friend Jerry, the uh, opinion, he said, sounds good. And Jerry said back, well, I know that I'm the eighth guy to whom this deal has been offered. Why would I be so smart if after the other seven guys who had the money and the inclination turned it down, uh, did so? And, and Dudley said, I don't know, but it sounds good to me. So Dudley says, well, uh, Jerry asked him, well, be my partner then. Hmm? Oh, which was a little problem for Dudley because he didn't have, they wanted a million bucks for the business, and he didn't have a half a million bucks. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was finally persuaded that maybe he could borrow it somehow because his own business was doing well. So um, uh, Jerry went uh, on his uh, ski plans over to Stad, Switzerland, while uh, Dudley went to uh, Nebraska to buy the Nebraska Sales Book Company, which which he did. They made a deal, and they hadn't closed the deal yet, but they made the deal. And uh, the uh, while Dudley went out there to operate the business, and he brought some expertise in from the making of the paint chips, and the company began to do better. And while they had been losing five thousand dollars a month. Now they actually began to make a small profit. So this was exciting for Dudley and Jerry. Boy, I'll say. And uh, the phone rang, and it was the Victor Comptometer Corporation saying, have lunch with me, uh, Dudley, because we want to make an acquisition in the forms field, and this sounds like one we'd like. So uh, uh, Dudley informed them, no, I don't actually own it yet. I've got the right to buy it in another month, but I don't own it yet. And they said, well, 
uh, we'll give you a million bucks just to go home and let us stand in your shoes. And that was great for Dudley because he didn't have to solve the problem about how to get the acquisition money. <laughs> and he could go back to his own business and have some extra money. And in the year that followed the uh, making of that deal, the price of Victor Comptometer uh, had doubled on the exchange, so they now had a lot of money for not buying the Nebraska sales book company. And that's when I met Dudley and he was he changed his mind about how to make money in the business world <laughs> instead of working like hell over paint chips. Uh, uh, why he, you buy a small, this is also a, at a time when there's a novel in the business bookstore is called Cash McCall. Mm -hmm. oh, and yeah. Cash McCall would come into a little company somewhere, uh, buy it, uh, get a better looking receptionist paint the front door and tinker with the books and sell it for a lot more than he paid for it. Sure. So uh, uh, Dudley had that uh, thought that that's maybe what uh, that's he could do. Good path to follow. And you know, here I was uh, younger than Dudley and uh, depended on him for money and I'd never uh, had any business experience like Cash McCall. So, uh, but he had me uh, working on looking at things. We looked at all kinds of uh, makers of things. We looked at uh, bathroom uh, facility makers in Fort Wayne. They made toilet seats and mm -hmm. some kind of uh, clothes hampers. Uh, and we looked at a, a jewelry box manufacturer in Indianapolis. And we looked at a fly swatter manufacturer up in St. Paul, <laughs> Minnesota. And one that we looked at was uh, a big printer of um, uh, personal business checks. In the old days, uh, you know, uh, the, somebody would issue an order for 25 million checks right. for the Chase Manhattan Bank or some uh, company like that. But now, instead of having one order for 25 million, you're liable to get uh, 250,000 orders for 200. Right. <laughs> because all the people had individual names and addresses on their personal checks. So the business had changed radically. Yes, well, you've, the seen, old checks you've seen so many changes like that, haven't you? Well, it all, all comes uh, sure. uh, <clears throat> from just time passing. Well, I know that you eventually wound up with uh, wonderful uh, manufacturing uh, in Loveland called Totes, yeah. where you made uh, worldwide uh, prominence and uh, great success. Well, thank you, it did feel successful. I know that uh, when I bought the company, I'd given you the figures before, but within eight seasons, we had the sales up to about $10 million. And uh, after they paid their chief executive uh, a million, uh, they had uh, a little over three million left over as pre-tax net profit. Wow. Wow. So we were profitable and doing well, well. I should say. Well, I know that you, you did so well with that. And Brad, I want, I want to point out your modesty is, is holding you back here a little bit, but you've been a prominent citizen of Cincinnati for many, many years. You've been involved in the arts. You've been a generous contributor to our Cincinnati Art Museum, among other things. Uh, and for years you played tennis at the old tennis club, which was Great, great stuff. I, mean, yeah. I think that's where we first met many years ago. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we're, we're about down to the end of the line here. And now you're, you're uh, comfortably retired and you have a beautiful place here in town. And uh, it's been a great, great opportunity to speak with you and to get to know you better than I did before. And I know that your family is going to enjoy this. And uh, that's very important. Uh, you're on the record for every, forever okay. now. I can't back out of it. Can't eh? back out of it now. No, no erasing. Okay. And uh, a copy of this goes to the Library of Congress Archives in Washington, and a copy stays here in our public library. So forever, people can look up Brad Phillips and find out about him and see what he looked like and everything. 
and I want to thank you for the opportunity. Thank it's you, Ted. It's a great pleasure, and I honor your friendship and <clears throat> respect it. And uh, I think things uh, things worked out here pretty well today. Well, thank you very much, Ted. I've You're enjoyed welcome. it. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ted Gardner, and I'm an interviewer with the Library of Congress Oral History Project, which is so capably handled here at our public library of Cincinnati uh, by our, our master degree historian, Dennis Daly. Uh, Dennis is our, also our videographer here today. And today we have the honor and the pleasure of, and particularly for me, of a longtime friend and uh, acquaintance and uh, uh, former tennis pal and all that sort of thing. We have Brad Phillips here today, um, who is going to impart his life story and uh, for the family and for anyone who will log on in time to, to see this and to understand uh, what this man is like and, and what a great citizen he's been in our community for so many years. Uh, Brad, um, I'd like to start out with where were you born? I was born in Evanston, Illinois. Oh boy, beautiful. Suffer of Chicago. Northwestern University. <clears throat> yes, it was right there. And the home of uh, Rotary International. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, what, were, what year were you born, Brad? 1923. 1923. And, uh, uh, what about your family? Did you have siblings or? <clears throat> I was the youngest member of our family. Excuse my frog in my throat. <laughs> <clears throat> my uh, sister was seven years my senior, hmm. and she passed away about six or seven years ago. Oh, that's sad. So yeah. she's not right. alive any longer, and my parents, of course, have been long gone. Yes, yes. My mother did live, live until her 93rd year. Wonderful. So uh, she did very well. That, I should say so. Well, <coughs> uh, growing up in Evanston, uh, uh, that was a beautiful town, is a beautiful town, yeah. of course, and uh, with the collegiate uh, background there and the atmosphere. Uh, where did you go to elementary school? I think I went to more than one. Uh, the family lived first on a street called uh, East Lake Terrace that was directly across the street from the northernmost beach that Chicago uh, appears on, mm. uh, north of uh, the downtown loop. Sure. And uh, I went to a small school there, and later we moved to Wilmette. Oh, yeah. Our residence was Wilmette. And I went to Central School there on Main Street in Wilmette, Illinois. Was that your high school? No, the high school was called New Trier, oh, and yeah. that was in Winnetka. Yeah, heard these of that. Are, these are all small cities, sure. small towns, and uh, New Trier was a well-respected high school. Oh yeah, I remember hearing about that, very high scholastic achievements and so forth. Uh, there are points in our lives uh, that we remember. Uh, any, anything about your, your family? Uh, uh, did you have travels as a teenager with your family and that sort of thing? Or During my lifetime, uh, I've traveled a fair amount, but not so much with the original Phillips fam I family. Uh, I remember one trip we took on the, uh, uh, on the lakes in which we went from Chicago up to the top of Lake Michigan, oh and then came down Lake Huron and and uh, uh, went to Detroit Wonderful. by by water. Yeah, and it was a, uh, an unusual way to get there, and oh, we I just enjoyed say. it. Yes, I should say. And today, in in our way of fast travel and so forth, it's uh, not not. A lot of people do that. You know, no. Take the time to do that. No, well, true. now, you know, there are other <clears throat> seminal points in, in one's life, and I like to hit uh, one in particular that we all remember uh, where we were on December the 7th, 1941. Well, I remember that very well. I was in Greencastle, Indiana, which is a little town about 200 miles south of Chicago. And I was a sophomore at uh, uh, DePaul University. And um, 
I was in my Phi Delta Theta fraternity house when the news came over the air that the Japanese had attacked uh, uh, Pearl Harbor. And the next morning, Sunday, uh, even though the attack took place in Pearl Harbor on Sunday, they were, of course, 12 hours ahead of us. Mm -hmm. So we listened to the, what, the president, what President Roosevelt had to say in the declaration of war against Japan. Right. And my roommate and I both decided we wanted to join the armed services in order to fight the Japanese. Uh, at the time, uh, we, we looked into it and it turned out that the Signal Corps had a program, an officer's training program, uh, that the, we could get into. We decided to wait until the current school year was finished in the succeeding spring, and then we both applied. Hmm. And the Signal Corps sent us to Chicago. Uh, it was their intent to have us involved in uh, radar, the, uh, the teaching of the installation and the operation and maintenance of radar, which was a brand new technology of those days. Uh, and so they sent us to Illinois Institute of Technology. Oh, yeah. And unfortunately, my roommate flunked out, and I don't know why he is. He did, because I thought of him as a bright guy. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I, I, I continued. And um, uh, they uh, had a school in Naperville, Illinois, which is another suburb of Chicago that's west of the lake, about 60 miles. And we, we went to that school and taught radar 24 hours a day, wow. 20, uh, seven days a week. And I worked uh, at my choice, by my choice, at the, on the second shift. So I would go to school at 4 p.m., uh, work until midnight, and then go back and where they, we had uh, dormitories there and uh, uh, get up and um, play a game of tennis or golf mm -hmm. and take a swim and then come back to work at 4 right. p.m. the next day. Now that was your, that's where you went for basic training too. That was your basic training? Well, it was, the initial it was what the Signal Corps <clears throat> wanted me to do. They hadn't taken me into the military service yet. I was still oh, a I civilian. See. You were still, gotcha. uh, they were paying me not very much, but I didn't need any money anyway, so because all I was doing is eating and sleeping there and right. teaching. <laughs> right. uh, and uh, after I'd done that a year, I grew rather restless. And you have to keep in mind, I was a dumb college kid. <laughs> uh, you know, I, th I thought, I'm not, really, I'm not really fighting the war. I want to be out there with a gun and I want to uh, kill all those Japanese who were so mean. So uh, I looked around and uh, the, the, the um, Air Force had a basic training program down in Miami. And if I could pass some kind of a test, why they would let me try that. Mm -hmm. So I left the Signal Corps uh, in uh, Naperville and joined the Air Force. And they sent me to a uh, Miami basic training facility at the end of which they decided they didn't want so many pilots anyway. So yeah, I know that. So there was we, that period there where yeah. a lot of people were washed so, out. So uh, they, they said, uh, uh, we'd like you to be in the infantry. And I said, you know, I'd, I'd, I'll, I'm willing to fight for my country, but I really don't want to be in the mud. Is there any place other than that? Well, we're looking for some chemical engineers. If you you can pass this test, why we'll send you to Brooklyn and you can go to uh, the university there. And uh, uh, so I did that. Uh, and when, after one semester at Brooklyn, they decided they didn't need so many chemical engineers. <laughs> oh, and what they wanted me to do was to get into the infantry. <laughs> they were still looking for foot soldiers. <laughs> and I still didn't want that, so I said, what else can I do? And there was nothing. So they had a, a, an opportunity to join the airborne infantry. And I thought, well, at least I'll get a ride to work. <laughs> and uh, so uh, uh, I got into the airborne industry. And uh, they sent me over to Reading, England, where in the 101st Airborne Division. And uh, on my first pra practice jump, not in combat, I tore ligaments in my left knee. Mm. 
And so they disqualified me from any further airborne training and assigned me to some place to rest my knee, namely the infantry. Thanks. So that's how I got into the, I'll be darned. Uh, the military now, service. Uh, that is, that's a very interesting progression. Uh, when, you were, when you were working with radar, was that something that was, uh, uh, that was pretty technical, wasn't it? Yes, and but, it was new uh, technology. We didn't even have any books. Yeah. We had mimeograph sheets. Right. And, you were uh, a pioneer in that field. In a, in a, in a low-level sense, I was, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then uh, do you feel that that gave you, uh, of course, you'd already had a good chemical background, chemistry background. Only that that I picked up in Brooklyn. Oh, St. John's University. You didn't, I thought you studied, you didn't study chemistry in college. Huh? No, I, I wanted to be an engineer, but I didn't think they made a lot of money, so uh, yeah. I switched over to marketing. Oh, I see. And, uh, <laughs> Very smart. <laughs> Look what I Turned know. out to work out all right. It but, worked out <laughs> fine, I'll but say. But I don't know how bright it was Boy, at the time. I'll say. Uh, well, that, that's very interesting because, you know, these, things, these steps in life, as you well know, are, as, as an industry leader, um, are important and, and sometimes they're the wrong turn and but sometimes you know they, they're very effective. Um, so there you were in England. Yeah. Holy cow. Far from home and <coughs> not wanting to be in the infantry. And they uh, uh, and of course they put me in the infantry so they and uh, when you're <laughs> when you're at the bottom end of the military uh, totem pole you don't really disagree with them about whatever they want you to do. Right. So they sent me to France and I landed at Normandy, but after D-Day, this was, uh, I'm gonna guess this was July. 44. That, uh, 44, or no, 45. Uh, see, the Japanese hit us in 44, but the D-Day, 6th of June was... Uh, it was 44. Was it 44? Yeah, June 6, 44. Oh, that was 41. And, uh, 41 uh, is when the Japs hit Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. All right. No, uh, 6th of June and 44 is when D-Day went D -Day. off, and I was not involved in that. Uh, but you were in England at that time? I you? was in England at the and time. You were, but you were training and getting prepared for Yes, that's right. And wow. they, they sent me over to... Um, on a troop ship to uh, Normandy, yeah. And by the time the troop ship got there, the, the, there was no no longer any uh, hostile fire, uh, so it was an easy transition from England into northern France. And we went through Paris and then through uh, the little countries above France, there, Belgium, Belgium and Holland, Luxembourg. and uh, uh, gradually filtered in into the uh, fighting front. Right, right. Well, <clears throat> tell, tell us about your time in England. Were you there long enough to get a feel of the country itself and, and something of the people? Uh, I think so, and I, I liked it very much. One terrible problem I had is somehow the um, pay scale never caught up with me, and even though I was earning the magnificent amount of something like $52 a month, I didn't have any of it, uh, and I didn't have any foreign money either, so I was really having to uh, uh, beg, borrow, and I didn't steal any, but I almost, <laughs> from my fellow troops over there to get anything, a magazine or a newspaper or, For uh, sake. you know, they would feed me in the commissary, but they, <laughs> I couldn't buy anything. So I like they screwed up your records. and. Well, I don't know. Maybe that was one of their ways of saving money. But uh, <laughs> I uh, hope they, I hope that pay caught up with you eventually. Oh, it did before sure. I left England. Uh, and uh, but you know, we've talked to so many people who had time in England and how they enjoyed uh, uh, the people there. You know, and uh, so I just thought maybe you might have had some particular experiences there. That, you want to relate. No, I really didn't, and uh, although I did like the country, uh, and uh, of course you, you know, have the advantage of being able to understand them. Sure. Uh, but so, it's, um, uh, you know, even a, 
light exposure like that, it, it, it has an impression on your life and it kind yeah. of broadens your horizons and knowledge and so forth, I should say. Um, so when you went across the channel on the ship, uh, you landed in Normandy, or did you? Was it Cherbourg or where? Uh, no, we landed at uh, La Havre. Uh, that's in Normandy. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> we were transported by truck uh, into Paris, and then subsequently through the smaller countries mm -hmm. up to where the 102nd Infantry Division, which was the division to which I'd been assigned, right, right. Uh, was located. Right. And uh, of course, the 102nd had had tremendous, uh, you know, tremendous conflict experience and, and it accomplished a lot by that time. Well, they, that was one of the reasons why I was being sent there. I was one of 40 replacements for A Company in the 406th oh, you were. Uh, in, uh, uh, forgotten the name of the division. 406th Regiment. Mm -hmm. no, regiment sounds wrong. Anyway, it's part of a division. A uh, battalion? Yeah. yeah. Uh, bigger than a, a battalion, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've forgotten a lot over the years. <laughs> well, we tend to do that. But uh, the uh, being in France, did you get to spend any time in Paris? I spent a couple of days there. Uh huh. <clears throat> and it's a beautiful city, of course. Yeah. And I'd never, at that time, I'd never been there before. So I bought some mementos and uh, with the pay that had finally caught up to me by that time. <laughs> you could afford and, something uh, then, huh? And I had a good time. Get them sent back home and all that. Yeah. Do you still <laughs> have me uh, mementos of your... I don't think I did. I think I gave them away when I got back yeah. from the service. Yeah. Now... I'm, I'm intrigued because I never got to the European theater and, and uh, uh, I always wanted to, but and the Navy did not see fit. But um, being in France like that and, and working your way, uh, you said the northern countries, you went through Belgium and the Netherlands. And, and Holland and uh, uh, Luxembourg. And I don't remember Luxembourg. I know it's, it's right there, but yeah. I don't remember it. But I do remember Holland. As a matter of fact, uh, in Holland, I'd been on army food for some long time, and a very nice family had volunteered to take some soldiers in and feed them a nice dinner, and they did. And I was so sick for the next two or three days because that food was so rich oh compared God. with what I'd been eating <laughs> that uh, really made me sick. Oh, for God's sake. Now, they were terribly nice people. Oh, yeah, so, so generous. I, I, never, I never complained to anybody, <laughs> but, but I was pretty sick. No, you couldn't do that. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, that you know, there, there again, you're, you're, you had experiences that uh, a lot of people didn't have, and uh, so what? What were uh, when you finally caught up with the hundred and second? Then what happened? Well, they organized us into specific jobs, and at the time I was, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a big guy, but I was fairly wide and thick. So they handed me this heavy gun called a Browning automatic rifle. So this is yours, <laughs> and uh, uh, it was I think it was about an 18 or 19 pound gun, and that's without ammo. Yeah. So you you got a, an ammo bearer to be your uh, not you weren't in charge of him, but anyway he went with you, and he carried a lot of the uh, clips and uh, bandoliers from which you got the ammo. Mm-hmm. So. Um, uh, we, um, the first combat I got into, uh, I can't even tell you the name of the place that it was, except that it was in Germany. Mm -hmm. I remember the name of a town somewhere in there, near Gerensweiler. And I don't know where Gerensweiler is in Germany, but uh, I can remember there being a lot of brisk military action around Gerensweiler. Uh, were, and you, it, were you a marksman? Uh, I was pretty good. I'd uh, entirely because I liked to. Mm -hmm. In high school, I'd learned how to shoot fairly accurately. Good. And I had a uh, uh, pretty good records in being able to hit the target. I had never been shooting people before, but no. uh, 
No, that that was uh, that was quite a shock and uh, quite something different that you never had really thought much about up to that point. Uh, how long were you in Germany? I got there, uh, as I say, in the in the fall of 1944, and uh, in the in May of 1945, the war was over. Yep. So I was still in Germany and they sent me down now into a camp where we were awaiting transportation back to the USA. Mm -hmm. And they sent us to a place called Hof, H-O-F. And it's a very attractive area, uh, mountainous territory. And uh, it, it's a nice place. and. Uh, I met a lot of Germans that were nice, and uh, mm -hmm. I was sorry that we were having to shoot them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't, weren't at that point, of course. Right. Uh, but uh, we waited there, and we waited longer than we had expected to wait, because the ships that they had planned to use to transport us back to the USA were breaking up in the North Atlantic Sea in the winter, mm -hmm. and they obviously the army couldn't cause that to, or let that happen because uh, you know here you got through the war with a, if you were still alive and right. uh, and they weren't going to drown you on the way no, home. No, I should so, say not. So we had to wait for uh, uh, larger boats. Did and you have any uh, any preliminary information or warning that uh, <clears throat> A lot of people would be transported and transferred to the Pacific in case that we had to invade Japan. <clears throat> I don't think there was any official warning or any official um, uh, announcement, but everybody knew we were still fighting the Japanese, right. and I expected to go to Japan. Right. And I read with great interest in the Stars and Stripes, and that was our little newspaper for the Army, about the um, uh, development of the atomic bomb and it's, uh, it's leveling uh, both uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yeah. And I think that the atomic bomb was a really a, a very significant lifesaver in World War II because Absolutely. millions and millions and millions would have died if yes. we had to take uh, Japan That's right. uh, with the infantry and fight from house to house as we would have had to do and you know a tremendous number of Japanese and Americans oh, yes. would have been killed so it's really a the amount that we killed in uh, uh, that I have read anyway in Hiroshima was around 80,000 right away now some people died later yeah as a result of uh, uh, their exposure to those gamma rays right but uh, basically that sold the Japanese on the idea that there's no sense in continuing to fight, and they were willing to um, uh, surrender. Yes, that was... Um, so I, I read that news in the Stars and Stripes with sure. great interest, and I hoped that that meant maybe the war is going to be over soon. Right. And of course it was before any of us had yeah. to go. Yeah. Yeah, they finally got the message after that yeah. second bomb. Yeah. Right. Well, the <clears throat> yes, as you point out so clearly, uh, for people that don't understand and, you know, really don't know what it was like in those days, but, uh, you know, estimates range anywhere from five to seven million Japanese would have been killed if, we, yeah. if we'd had to attack them. And of course, we could have lost a thousand, I mean, a million of our own people. And, uh, yes, we could. It was, uh, it, was, it was a tremendous... The Japanese uh, had a code of, of uh, battle in which they did not give up. Uh, they, they, it was just not in their code of honor. You had to die before yep. you gave up. Yep. So the, the, the deaths would have been incredible and on our side as well. Yeah, and even, you know, I, even, even uh, though we were bombing heavily in Japan and so forth, uh, they, had, uh, they had set up a system of manufacturing below ground. You know, they were still making war material uh, yeah. when they finally gave up. Well, you know, that, um, <coughs> the, uh, so what happened then when you finally got the word that you had orders to go back to the States and uh, 
Where did well, you go from there? We went to um, a little town uh, near, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the town. It was a seaport. Mm -hmm. uh, French? Bremerhaven. Oh, German, North yeah. Germany. Yeah, Bremerhaven. And, uh, uh, and while we were there, and we were told it would be there some months, uh, we formed, uh, you know, we did other th things that are interesting and peaceful, like uh, I joined an orchestra that was among the uh, uh, armed force personnel, made up of armed force. Sure. Armed what force did you personnel. play? I played the trumpet. No kidding. Yeah. That's wonderful. Actually, I'd, I played the same trumpet that I'd brought over because I always liked the trumpet, so I had it with me, and yeah. while there were one or two bullet holes in the casing of the the, the little, uh, the little uh, leather casing that uh, I brought with me. Why the trumpet itself was not injured during the war, <laughs> <laughs> and I had used it at some camps to blow reveille and taps. Yeah, uh, for the troops. That when that 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 was great, and that was fun, and that was something special that you could you know that you could do, and um, and in those days, of course, you had you had. Uh, you had unit bands, as you point out. Yeah. And, uh, and we would entertain uh, other units. Sure. Uh, yeah, that was great stuff. It was, it was, a, it was fun. It was something special. Yeah. You, you're exactly right. So there you were in Bremerhaven. That, of course, that was, that was a, a major German port there in the, on the North Sea. Uh, so your ship came in, and you got aboard. Well, it took quite a while to come in. <clears throat> uh, I don't believe that we got out of Bremerhaven until um, well let me see I'm, I'm, I'm remembering things that I can't put in the times mm -hmm. in the time scale here I remember I being uh, in um, <clears throat> The woods when the Germans started the uh, uh, Battle of the Bulge, and um, it was that was just about Christmas, mm -hmm. <coughs> and I was pretty impressed that the army had managed to get hot food out to the foxholes <laughs> yeah. in Christmas yeah. when there was shooting going on. Yeah. So uh, I was pretty impressed with my army. I should. But say. anyway, when that was over. Uh, we continued towards Berlin, which was our, uh, our uh, goal. And the, um, we got about 35 miles from Berlin and the uh, decision was made by the uh, top officers not to take Berlin, but to wait there for the Russians to take it. Yeah, politics. And so we did that. And the, the, uh, I know I have heard the statement that Eisenhower had said in defense of his move that, you know, if the 10,000 mothers whose, li whose sons' lives would have been lost will write me and say that that was okay to not take Berlin, then I'll feel worse about it. But uh, right now, I don't, uh, I think I made the right move. <laughs> uh, yeah, but the Russians really uh, were very tough troops and they did not treat the, the Germans with anything except hatred and contempt. Yeah. Uh, and I guess they had ample reason for feeling that way. Oh, yeah. So uh, the Germans were giving up to us. If we simply showed up somewhere, we sure. didn't get shot at a lot. They simply said, where do you want us to put the, the arms? <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, the uh, we waited, as I say, for um, quite a good while. I don't, I don't, I'm trying to remember when I actually got home. Did you have any contact with the Russians? Uh, yes, but more in bars than in, uh, I see. in, in yeah. battle situations. Yeah. And they were very uh, happy, well-met people mm -hmm. at the mm -hmm. time, I guess, because we were helping them. and. Uh, sure. And they were winning themselves. Oh yeah. Well, we'd help save their skins too. Yes, we know? did. <laughs> they, they don't want to admit it, but anyway, uh, that uh, uh, so 
How long, how long did you think you were in Bremerhaven before you got aboard the ship? <laughs> I was trying to construct that. I think I got back in 1946, uh, just after Christmas. So it would have been a major piece of a year, like six to eight months. Wow, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you were. Golly Moses and in the infantry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I was, Any funny I was, stories or anything? Uh, well, I can remember a story that's more of a just interesting life story. Uh, there was one soldier that was with me at the time who was very frightened of becoming seriously seasick to the point that he would oh, die. Oh my gosh, yes. And he was convinced that if, if he had to get on that those relatively small boats. Yeah. You know, I happened to go over on a big boat. I think it carried 10, 15,000 troops. Wow. Uh, but uh, on these little boats in the North uh, uh, Sea yeah. in the winter, why he was terrified. And he was so terrified that he was sick from the moment that he'd been told, he'd been told that the boat he was going to be on was in a harbor he became terribly ill, not because of seasickness, because nope. he wasn't on the boat yet. It's just a month. Uh, but, yeah. but he nearly died. Isn't that awful? I know there were people. So like the that. mind really has a lot to do with what you, what your state of health is. I should say, yeah, yeah. There, there was a lot of that. I know that it was not uncommon. There were people that were just so fearful of yeah. getting sick and so forth. Well. Um, the ship you went over on when you first went over to England was that a big uh, was that, that was a big, big ship? That was a big passenger liner. Okay. It was about seven eight hundred feet long. Yeah. And uh, the, in the big rooms, the rooms they had for uh, parties and dances, they had built just enormous uh, structures of uh, of beds. You know, three Folks. four five layer beds. In sure. Which you, uh, you climb up on a ladder if you're on the fifth layer while you, you had to strap yourself in so you didn't fall out when the right. boat healed. But uh, uh, there, there would be a lot of people in that room. <laughs> oh, yeah. And a lot of those people got sick, too. <laughs> Not so many in the, uh, in the general population there, but there were certain guys that were just convinced yeah. that they were going to be terribly sick. and. Uh, and uh, they managed to talk themselves they, into it. They, generally, they were. Yeah, they, they yeah. were really sick. Yeah, yeah. Well, now, then, uh, did you come back on a big ship, too? No, I got, came back on a medium-sized ship uh -huh. uh, that was larger than the ships that had been made by Kaiser on the West Coast. Here. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. But uh, uh, it was a medium-sized ship, and it was quite, I didn't have any problem with it. Right. Uh, so, uh, now, I don't consider myself any kind of a mariner, but you know I sailed sailboats and uh, paddled canoes up and down rivers in right. Wisconsin, and <laughs> so being on the water in, the, in a boat on the water did not seem strange. Right, right. Well, you know that's and that's an interesting uh, uh, remark that you've made because uh, you know looking back at your pre-war days college, high school, you know, and you had exposure to nice things like that, nice activities like that. I had a sailboat when I was in, in high school. You did? Yeah. Wow. Small one. Yeah. Anchored in the Wilmette Harbor. I'll be darned. Uh, which is pretty small, but yeah. uh, kind of cute. Oh, Wilmette was a, yeah, but Wilmette was a beautiful community too. Yeah. Still is, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I had a little... I had some time at Glenview at the Naval Air uh -huh. Station there. I uh, played golf there at Glenview, oh yeah. Glenview Naval Air Station. Right, great. <laughs> well, now, okay, so there you are at Bremerhaven, and the ship is in, and you're going aboard. And uh, did you come right straight across the Atlantic? You didn't have to yes, do Yes, we anything? did. We, well, uh, we, we didn't go anywhere else. But they uh, went, because it was during the bad weather, they went south, oh. really, 
sure. uh, along the west coast of Europe, France, until they got down near the uh, uh, Azores. Mm -hmm. And then they, in effect, made a turn towards the United States yeah. and, and then went directly from there to New York. Sure. Which is where we came in. Okay, now. Um, and I remember one thing. Oh, good. At, at, uh, on the way back, we stopped at a place that the uh, uh, management uh, that was on board said was the deepest hole in the uh, uh, Atlantic Ocean. It was something like over 20,000 feet depth at that point. And even though I was a good swimmer, it gave me a funny feeling to swim <laughs> and realize that there were four or five miles <laughs> of ocean between me and the bottom. I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh boy, yeah, that was uh, that was a big a big consideration. Well, yes, and that's interesting what you say about going south to get that North Atlantic. Of course, was so terrible, and but then you got advantage of some of the effect of the Gulf Stream and yeah. that kind of weather and so forth. So you got into New York. You went into uh, into Manhattan, one of the big piers there. Or? Uh, going to Jersey, or where, where did you go in? I'm trying to think how I got from there to uh, <coughs> the Great Lakes Naval Training Station was where they discharged me, and I'm trying to remember exactly what the route was. Must have been by rail. I would imagine you took rail from New yeah. York to uh, uh They Chicago. didn't do anything by bus, so it must have been by rail. I don't specifically remember yeah. it. And those, and of course, those trains in those days, you know, they were... They were pretty rugged too. Yeah. You know, they weren't the, the luxury uh, uh, Orient Express type of a train. No. <laughs> but and you know, as as you pointed out, your um, close proximity with other other bodies, you know, wherever you were you, uh, aboard a ship or you know in a cantonment or whatever it might be. Uh, you met a lot of different kinds of people. Yes, <clears throat> that's true. And uh, of course, uh, I had been married in my early period during the service. Oh. When I was, um, uh, I got married in Evanston, Illinois, to a girl that I had met down at DePaul. And she had been waiting for me in Evanston. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Wonderful. And so it was really great to see her again. Oh, and to, uh, uh, we rented a room. Her, her older sister had married a guy who was a businessman. He, had, he owned a house on, in Evanston. And we moved into the house in one of the rooms that I rented. And I stayed there until I got a job with a, a Chicago company that manufactured industrial textiles and uh, rubber products. Where did you finish your college? I never finished college. Oh, I see. You had the two years. Uh, the, the GI Bill permitted me to take some additional right. uh, college and they would pay for it, so I did that. But I never, but I kept getting moved around. I went to uh, Milwaukee's, uh, uh, let's see, the University of Wisconsin mm -hmm. for a while, then I went to uh, Boston, and I went to uh, uh, Boston University, and then I... Uh, Did you like Boston? Oh, I liked it a lot. It was very, a lot of it was historical. We lived sure. in Wellesley, actually. We oh, had a yeah, sure. home there. Great city. And I enjoyed it, so... Uh, yeah. Uh, and then we moved from Wellesley to Fort Wayne, Indiana. Oh, yeah which from a business standpoint was okay, but my new bride couldn't stand it. You know, the, she always cared a lot about uh, uh, nice quality um, fashion mm -hmm. uh, clothing. And in, in Fort Wayne, the place you went to get fashion clothing was probably either Sears, Roebuck and Company or uh, a J.C. Penney. Mm -hmm. So she couldn't stand living there. <laughs> So although business-wise it was a good move, why it drove her nuts. Right. And we happened to meet somebody in that town and across the street neighbor, uh, and the two of us uh, looked for businesses together. And um, 
uh, uh, we found the company that I later ended up buying down in Cincinnati. Right. Uh, it was then called the Solomar Trevor Company. Mm -hmm. But after I owned it for three or four years, why well, we changed the name to Totes Incorporated. Boy, we remember it well, and what a, what an outstanding company it is, and uh, it was under your your leadership and everything. Um, but you know, going back a little bit, uh, in a service situation, everyone had this feeling of of comradeship and close association yeah, that's true. with your buddies and. Do you have any uh, any friends left that you remember? Yes, I do. Uh, as, a, as a matter of fact, the 102nd Division <clears throat> had a uh, reunion in uh, uh, northern Ohio about three or four years ago. And I remember my platoon sergeant uh, from the, the division, and I telephoned him, and he, he had an unusual name, Tom Gajewski. Mm -hmm. And he lived in Hamtramck, Detroit, mm -hmm. Good and he was still name. there. So yeah. I, I called Tom and I said, is there any chance you're going to go to that uh, uh, reunion? He said, yes. And I said, well, I'd like to, I'll, I'll look for me. I'll, I'll go be up there oh, too. Good. So we had a nice dinner and did a few things together and he brought his wife. I didn't uh, uh, bring mine, but uh, it was nice to see him and he's a Isn't neat guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a wonderful. It's a bond that that you really never sever. Right. And even though you might not uh, be close, you know, after you get out of the service, but uh, because we all, you know, we all disseminated yeah. around the country, and and uh, but those those things are nice, and uh, uh, it it kind of gives you. Uh, I'm sure you felt this because you in your heart, your love for your country and everything, <clears throat> and your admiration for your buddies and comrades and so forth, meant so much. Yeah, that's great. Now, I want to ask you, you know, speaking of Fort Wayne, right north there in Auburn is a great, unbelievable World War II museum. Really, I didn't know that. Well, you know the man that started the uh, the Auburn Cord uh, Museum yes. there years ago. Well, I know of him. Yes. Yeah. Well, just recently, this is a great story, and I don't want to take up too much of your time here, but I want you to know about it, and that is that the the Victory Museum in Auburn now, by the same man who's a very wealthy multimillionaire, bought a World War II museum in Belgium that had unbelievable, I mean, a lot of all the German and tanks and cars and oh guns my. and just, you can't imagine. He bought that whole museum's contents for $35 million and he moved it all to Auburn, Indiana. You've got to get up there and see that. That's interesting. And it is, and you know Auburn, what, 20 miles north of Fort Wayne. It's easy to get there. I don't remember where it was. Uh, Directly north, you, right I up, see. what is that, 65? That highway that goes Oh, up? I've forgotten. I don't, yeah. I don't even think they had those uh, well, interstate I'm, routes. I'm going to give days. you some literature on that, and you go up there and see that. It, it, I, it's well worth your while. I, I wouldn't mislead you on that. But anyway, um, Indiana, of course, um, how long were you in business in Indiana? A couple of years. Okay. Uh, and at the time, as I say, uh, my wife, Jean, who was a very nice lady, uh, couldn't stand it. She just couldn't stand it. And even though we had a nice home and uh, met some nice people, uh, she didn't like living in Fort Wayne. So one of my neighbors uh, was a uh, entrepreneur who was running a factory that made, uh, that printed paint chips. If you go into a store that sells paint, they might give you a uh, printed uh, a folder from which you can see what the colors are. If you put, you know, one gallon of ivory with, uh, mm -hmm. with uh, you know, a half pint of uh, 
number 302 while you get this shade. Sure. So somebody has to print with great precision those colors. Yes. And he, uh, his name is Dudley Ruttenberg, and Dudley uh, was running that company. Uh, and um, were you in merchandising, or were you in? No, I was a salesman, uh, okay. I, and he was just my across the street neighbor. Mm -hmm. So I was selling. Uh, Fort Wayne is in the in in a circle of cities that makes most of the fractional horsepower motors in the country, uh, and uh, fractional horsepower motor, uh, motors contain elements of the parts that uh, we made in our in the company that employed me. Mm -hmm. So as a salesman, I was there to call on them and get their business, which I was doing. Oh yeah, well, that's a great business. I can imagine you're you're <clears throat> gaining experience and and uh, so forth and so on in that high tech industry. Well, now Dudley uh, uh, had an airplane, but he didn't like to fly unless it was just perfect weather. Yeah, and uh, and he also tended to get car sick if he drove. Oh, so in the in the looking for possible acquisitions, I was mostly the uh, uh, the leg man. I had to go do you know get, bring him a report if it looked good enough why he'd come, because he was basically the money man. And he knew a right. lot more about it than I did, and we looked at all kinds of things. Like uh, <laughs> I looked at a company that manufactured uh, fly swatters up in St. Paul, Minnesota. <laughs> and a company that made uh, jewelry boxes in Indiana, and a uh, company that printed checks very specialized in Baltimore. Thing. Yeah. And uh, yeah, this is during the time that the MICR uh, encapsulation was being uh, utilized in the check industry, so that you know the uh, a machine could recognize where that check belonged. Right. So all the checks had to be uh, uh, coded that way. Mm -hmm. And some of the big check printers were going out of business or being damaged severely because in the old days they used to get an order from say Chase Bank for 50 million checks. And uh, nowadays since the, everybody's putting their individual name on the check, Right. And they didn't want 60 million. What they wanted is 200 with, you know, 600 Main Street on it. Mm -hmm. So they come up with 500,000 orders, <laughs> all of which are different. Uh, maybe the total was 60 million, but it was a terrible job to write the orders. Oh my gosh! I'll so say. there are a lot of companies for sale in that period. <laughs> well, the um, uh, we didn't buy it. <laughs> he didn't buy. It. He didn't buy. It. <laughs> when did you go, when did you finally come to Ohio? Well, on one of these trips at which Dudley didn't want to drive, I had heard about a company that was for sale that manufactured grave markers and uh, <laughs> and bronze uh, decorations for bank doors and things like that. And I came down to look at it, and it wasn't a very good deal, and I didn't think anything could be done with it, so I. Uh, came back and reported to Dudley that it was a wasted trip. But the phone rang about a week later and the business broker that had brought me down to look at that Art Bronze company said there's another company down here for sale, Solo Marks Rubber Company. And I had never heard of it. I said, well, what do they make? I said, well, they make uh, boots for... Uh, rainwear and things like uh, that. And some rainwear. And, uh, uh, my wife Jean at the time said, uh, oh, and they, they were uh, making some of these small boots under the name Totes. Hmm. So uh, Jean said, I think Tom, our son Tommy, who was then about uh, 10 years old, uh, may have had a pair of those. So we took a look and he did. Okay. So I went down and looked at it and <laughs> it wasn't very good, but I thought, but Dudley had been passing up deals that I thought we ought to do something with. And I couldn't do anything about it because he was the money man. Right. But uh, uh, so I was looking for something. Maybe I could buy it on my own and not have to talk Dudley into buying it. So I came back with a story about uh, Solomark's Rubber Company, and Dudley was predictably disinterested in it. <laughs> but I borrowed uh, 
I figured out a way if I borrowed some money from my mother and cashed in the uh, cash value of the uh, uh, account I'd been building up with my employer and sold my house, I might be able to get in this business. So I did all that and uh, I, I was able to buy them. And it wasn't a big price because they, in those days, they were doing about seven hundred thousand dollars a year. Oh gee! And uh, uh, they, after they paid the chief executive twenty-five thousand dollars, why they had five thousand left over for net profit. So, <laughs> so, uh, so it, it was a fairly cheap company to buy, and so I was able to buy it, and I did. That's great. And I settled that in 1961. 61, okay. Well, of course, then you build it into the great company that it is and, and uh, worldwide exposure you had. Uh, well, we, had, we were the best-selling brand in England and uh, Canada and in the United States. And um, uh, we were maybe the strongest brand in the industry. Sure, sure. Now, you said, um, how about your children? You got anybody here in town, or? Uh, I have uh, one boy here in town that, that is my first son, mm -hmm. and he's now about 57, I, I think, uh, and he's that, within a year of that, and he has a dental practice here in town, and oh. he's, a good, he's a good dentist. Wonderful. And uh, my daughter, who is about four or five years younger, is a um, uh, surgical path pathologist down at uh, St. Louis University Hospital in uh, St. Louis. Oh my. So we see her occasionally because that's not too far. Right. And then I left Jean for a while and had uh, was married separately and uh, had two children in that marriage and they're both younger. Mm -hmm. One of them uh, is out on the west coast working for Boeing as an aeros okay. aerospace engineer. Wow. <clears throat> and the other is working in the uh, foreign exchange department of Fifth Third Bank oh, right. here in Cincinnati. Oh, wow, that's wonderful. So, so I see the kids yeah. fairly frequently. I should say, and a very accomplished group they are. Well, uh, I, I'm not giving them that much uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, they have any plaudits because they haven't done much yet except work. <laughs> well, I'll see you later how they Yeah, how they we do. all know what that's like. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, you've at been... At least uh, they're off the home payroll. Right. <laughs> uh, well, and another thing, and, and you certainly uh, uh, should, you know, let people know about, and uh, people know about you and your accomplishments, uh, your generosity and your uh, acquired community here in Cincinnati and your devotion to it and your uh, bene beneficence. Uh, Brad has been uh, uh, a tremendous boon to our community and, uh, and, and people should know about that and your family ought to be aware of that too. Well, it's nice of you to say that. that uh... Well, we've been, uh, you know, over at the old tennis club for years and years and all yeah. that sort of thing. Uh, looking back over your career and over your life and your varied uh, experiences and so forth, um, what do you uh, what what do you rate as a uh, is there one outstanding um, accomplishment or part of your life that you like to talk about? <clears throat> Well, uh, I think I did a good job with the company that I bought because uh, I, I built the sales up and the profitability. After I'd taken the uh, company over, uh, we were still under a million dollars for a couple of years, but then television was breaking. Oh, yeah. So I learned how to use television and coordinated it with uh, print advertising, and I got the company up to Ten million dollars in about eight different seasons. Wow! And at the ten million dollar level, we were very profitable. Right. So I kept on adding products and bu building the company's uh, 
staff. And I, I, by the time I quit working hard on it in the 1980s, we were up to a little over 200 million. Wonderful. Uh, so, uh, Great accomplishment. So, and I you know, treated the people fairly, and they, uh, they were good employees, and uh, we did well. And as I say, we had an inter international brand. Sure, sure. So, um, well, that, that certainly is true, and anybody that uh, uh, knows about uh, totes uh, certainly uh, recognizes that that brand name. and what a wonderful name what a, a catchy funny thing i wish i could say i invented it yeah. but, I, but i didn't <laughs> no i did use it more than the uh, inventor had the inventor expected, right yeah. right well that was that was very smart of course um you know and looking back we've got a couple of minutes left but uh, on your on your military career and you're talking about what, four years going to the 102nd reunion. Is there, are there any events coming up uh, related to your military experience that you're looking forward to? No, uh, not that I know of, Ted. Uh, the last organized effort was the one I spoke of, yes. uh, which the division had a reunion in Northern Ohio. I'd been to a prior reunion uh, some several years before that, but um, I'm not aware, of, for, one, for one thing, a lot of these old folks are dying off. Oh, yes. So <laughs> there are well, probably not very many people left with the, with the well, energy to organize. That, that is one of our great concerns, and yes, it's true. Um, figure that I hear and have heard for the last six months or so is 1,500 a week are dying of World yeah. War II veterans. And you know, when you think about 16 and a half million people, hmm. Americans, served in the armed forces. And now we're down to about 3 million. So you can imagine. And, uh, but it is important uh, about a heightened interest in those of us who are left. Uh, because people are beginning to realize, and through things like television, WCET does a great job of uh, recognizing veterans. Our library here, this history department, yeah. this is one of the great history departments in the country. And I mean that sincerely and I know about it. And uh, they are, are very, very, very involved in uh, veterans awareness. And of course, every Veterans Day, the 11th of November, right downstairs here in the atrium was one of the finest uh, Veterans Day ceremonies you'll find in the country. And, mm -hmm. uh, I hope you can come this coming uh, November the 11th. Uh, they'll get 400 people down there in the atrium, and it's a wonderful program. This library was dedicated to veterans of Hamilton County I when see. it was built. Well, I think we have a very nice library uh, system here in Cincinnati. Yeah, we're very lucky. We've got a lot of um, books, and we have a lot of facilities, and yes. uh, it does a good job. Well, and you'd mentioned earlier Joe Stern, of course, who yes. served on the Charlie board. Charlie Lindbergh is another guy. I know oh, yeah, uh, right. Charlie active. Lindbergh, he's still active, and, and uh, Bill Moran and those people. So, uh, Brad, is, this has been a real pleasure, and, and to have the opportunity to speak with a friend and uh, an acquaintance of, of many years uh, has been a great privilege for me, and I want to thank you for your participation, your service to our nation. Well, God bless, and uh, you'll get a DVD of this for your family, and you well, take a look at it. Well, that's very nice, Ted. I do appreciate it. Thank you so and much. It's been a pleasure on my side as well.